Am I on? Okay. All right. All right. Um, good afternoon to all of you. Welcome to our IBD Gecko session. So uh, today we've got a case presentation uh, by Dr. Ram Makan, and then we will have a presentation uh, from uh, Dr. Wayne, uh, both of whom are based at the Orange Free State. So welcome to the session. And as you know, these meetings are hosted by the uh, Gastroenterology Foundation, along with Project ECHO. They happen every Wednesday at 4.30, and uh, we welcome you and any newcomers. So we're gonna start with the case presentation. Please feel free to put any questions in the chat, or after the presentation, uh, you're welcome to put your hand up and unmute and ask the question. And then we will go on to the uh, talk uh, by uh, Dr. Wayne uh, Simmons. Without further ado, um, Ram, if you're ready, uh, over to you. We're looking forward uh, to listening to your case. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, all right, so this is a case presentation of um, Mr. K. Mitch, who's a 43-year-old male patient that we saw at our hospital. Um, he comes from Bethlehem. He was seen at the base hospital there. Um, he's married. He's a father of three, and he works in pick and pay as a merchandiser. So he mentioned that he's been taking more and more sick leave of late, and he's been feeling too ill to work. He was initially referred to the hepatobiliary surgical team um, at Universitas Hospital, and he was referred to them with obstructive jaundice and pruritus in March 2022. Um, the gastromedical team was then consulted for the medical workup of his jaundice, and um, the primary concern at that stage was to exclude primary sclerosing cholangitis. So his bedside history um, was such that he had a one month history of jaundice and severe itching. The itching was what concerned him the most and made him come to hospital. Um, he also complained of unintentional weight loss over the preceding months and was about 15 kgs of weight loss. He also had diarrhea and hematochesia for the last two months. He passed three to four stools per day. There was blood. He also had urgency and there was no tenesmus. He did not have any prior known medical history that he mentioned, and he had no lower back, no joint complaints. He also did not have any eye symptoms and did not have any skin rashes as well. Um, he admitted to drinking alcohol. He said he drank approximately a bottle of whiskey per weekend, but he stopped a week before his admission. He was a non-smoker and did not take any traditional medication. So on examination, he was a thin and tall individual. His weight was 60 kgs and his height was 1.73 meters, which gave us a BMI of 19 kgs per meter squared, which is on the underweight side. He had hyperpigmentation of his skin. He also had excoriation marks on his arms and legs. He had deep scleral jaundice. He also had pallor and clubbing. His pupils were normal. He also had a resting tachycardia of 108 beats per minute and a blood pressure of 106 over 56 millimeters mercury. His temperature was 37.8 degrees Celsius. So we then went on to look at his blood results. Um, of note, one can appreciate he has a high white cell count. Um, he has a microstatic hypochromic anemia, and he also has a cholestatic pattern on his liver function enzymes. His CRP was 26. His GFR was greater than 60. He also had a low calcium and low phosphate. Um, we then proceeded to do a sigmoidoscopy and we took rectal biopsies. Um, so he's, macroscopically, we saw he had a Mayo 2 colitis that was involving the rectum only. And as we proceeded, the sigmoid became normal. The histology confirmed that he had ulcerative colitis or active colitis. He had, um, this is his histology pictures. We can see in this image, he has crypt distortion here and micro abscesses. And here on this image, we can see that there is uh, cryptitis, the lymphocytic infiltrate over here. 
on the top right hand side corner. And then here we can see Panet's uh, metaplasia as well. Uh, we then proceeded to do an MRCP, and one could then appreciate the typical beaded pattern that one would see in a patient with PSC. This is the patient's actual image. Okay, so we then started him on treatment. Uh, we assessed him as a severe ulcerative colitis um, with a normal stool MCNS, meaning there was no pathogenic bacteria identified. He was started on prednisone 50 milligrams daily, um, azathioprine 100 milligrams daily, sulfasalazine 1 gram TDS, also deoxycholic acid 300 milligrams TDS, and cholestyramine 4 grams BD, and vitamin D and calcium. So the patient improved um, and reported his, his symptoms were actually getting better. He was then discharged. However, he came back six months later and he complained of worsening jaundice and pruritus. He reported that his UC symptoms had settled. One can also, on, during the second admission, one could appreciate that his bilirubin actually went up and he still had this cholestatic pattern on his LFT. So at that time, we excluded acute viral drugs and alcohol as causes. Um, and we then proceeded to do a second MRCP for him. And one can see that he has dilatation of his biliary tree um, on the right-hand side here. And then one can appreciate as well on the left-hand side, there's dilatation as well. So he's got dominant strictures on either side of his biliary trees. One can appreciate here as well, the, the, the narrowing and proximal dilatation is on this image. So he was assessed to have a dominant stricture and the greatest concern at that point was to exclude cholangial carcinoma, although it could have also been progression of disease. So we then proceeded to get histology of his bile ducts. Um, so basically it confirmed that he had active chronic colitis, uh, cholangitis rather, um, with an inflammatory infiltrate. So here we can see the bile ducts on the histology and the surrounding inflammatory inf infiltrate um, around the bile ducts showing that he's got chronic cholangitis. We also did a liver biopsy um, during that admission and that confirmed that he had severe cholestasis um, with uh, cirrhosis. So here on the liver biopsy, we can see that we have enlarged hepatocytes. We have um, this feathery degeneration of these enlarged hepatocytes, and these dark areas are actually cholestasis. That's bile that's stained darker. Here as well, we can see more enlarged hepatocytes with the feathery degeneration and areas of cholestasis as well. Um, this is an immunohistochemical stain for CK7, which shows these dark images are the bile duct uh, proliferation. This is a Masson trichrome stain, which shows the bridging fibrosis that's happening between the hepatocytes in green. Okay, so at that point, because of the dominant strictures and we excluded a malignancy, we decided to insert a percutaneous transhepatic cholangiostomy tube to relieve the obstruction. So the patient then improved and uh, he reported re relief of his symptoms. A further two months later, the patient was then readmitted, and, but this time in septic shock. And on bacterial culture, we found that he grew an E. coli. So he presented quite ill. And we proceeded to do a CT scan and then found that he had this hypodensity um, in his liver, which we later um, assessed as a liver abscess, which was drained percutaneously. And we started him on antibiotics. Currently, the patient is discharged on oral antibiotics. He's improving. He reports he's doing well. He's uh, on medical incapacity leave and he's due for follow-up at our clinic uh, to complete the workup for his liver transplant. 
And we later discovered during the preparation of this presentation that he was actually diagnosed with ulcerative colitis in 2005 and was lost to follow up all these years. Thanks, that's the end. Dr. Simmons, you can continue. Um, thank you so much, uh, Ram. That was a very nice uh, case. And I think um, there are a lot of things uh, to discuss uh, on the clinical case. And thanks a lot for the beautiful uh, histology uh, pictures. Um, I wonder if anybody has any questions uh, about the case, perhaps uh, before we go on to the didactic lecture. Any comments or any questions? <clears throat> Okay, while we wait for people to come up with questions, um, I was just wondering if you were certain from your clinical picture and the MRCP that the patient in fact had a PSC, what was the rationale for doing the liver biopsy? Um, so the liver biopsy was taken because the patient was already um, um, at the theater for the uh, PTC drain insertion. So it was just done together because we had the opportunity. Yeah, okay, and I take it that despite the fact that he was cirrhotic, the liver was actually biopsyable because of course there are risks associated with biopsying a cirrhotic liver as well. Yes. Yeah, all right. Um, and the uh, bile duct histology. So did you do a duodenoscope with a side viewing scope or how did you get the biopsies of the bile ducts? Uh, that was done during ERCP uh, with a duodenoscope. I see. And brushings and that were done and that was negative for malignancy and... So, so we actually had to do it three times. The first two times were not representative and eventually on the third time we got this image, which is the actual patient's image. Yeah, I mean, these patients, as you know, are very difficult to diagnose and also to manage. Um, so thanks for that. I was also gonna ask you a Bilal's question uh, in terms of um, differential diagnoses, uh, whether you did uh, other biomarkers, so CA99, ANA, IgG4, uh, those sorts of things, sort of to exclude other possible etiologies in this context. Uh, we did uh, do the workup. I, I just uh, omitted to present it, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, so if, I can, if I can come in, maybe, I mean, you, you know, we, 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 we did look, think of other things. And I mean, prior to you know, presenting him for these procedures, especially the last ERCP, you know, we had to look through and he had no autoimmune serology. We did consider overlap. Uh, the gamma globulins were raised, but the IgG4 specifically was not raised. And he, strangely, he never had a, a raised CA99, but his, his sudden presentation with this worsening uh, sort of warranted the evaluation, I think. No. No, a difficult case for us. No. no, it is a difficult case, I must say. It's not your sort of typical uh, mainstream um, uh, patient. I think there were many things to consider uh, in him other than just the PSC related to the IBD. Um, Innocent is asking, why was the biopsy not taken from the right as well as TC? What's TC? Francis, what's TC? Francis, are you there? Transverse. Oh, transverse colon. Oh, you mean the, the colonic biopsy. Sorry, I thought you meant the, 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 the liver. Okay. So basically he's asking why was it uh, just a sigmoidoscopy and not a full colonoscopy at that stage? And I'm sure there's a perfectly good reason for that. We didn't do a full colonoscopy because he was in an acute flare. So we just limited ourselves to the sigmoidoscopy to get a diagnostic answer from the rectal biopsies. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Any other um, comments or questions? There's a lot to discuss, but perhaps uh, because there's a talk coming up, we can also hold it until then. Um, somebody's asking, I don't know why is the patient being worked up for a liver transplant? I think that's what the question is asking. Uh, Ram? I think you did explain the, the, that. Maybe they I think the question is, is the patient being worked up? Yes, the patient is being worked up currently for a liver transplant. Dr. Nuruddin, I hope that is the question you are asking. Um, and if so, I hope, uh, I hope you feel it's been answered. All right. Wayne, do you have any other comments about the case before you go on to your talk? Uh, 
Um, no, no other comments. I think it's just a case, you know, when we thought about discussing this topic, uh, you know, it was it was stemming from this case that we, um, you know, we had this difficulty with this patient. He's kept us quite busy uh, in terms of his workup. Uh, I see there's another point here about colon cancer. Um, I think we've had non-invasive imaging of him, uh, and certainly he, he requires a full-length colonoscopy, but he's just been so ill in terms of his cholestasis and the liver abscess and so forth that we haven't yet done the full length. Uh, I think certainly he requires it, but the non-invasive imaging uh, didn't give an obvious um, uh, mass lesion. He doesn't have mass lesions in the liver and uh, he doesn't have signs of um, obstruction either. And he responded quite well to his initial treatment for the UC. Um, so yeah, it, it's an unanswered question. It you know, is, yeah. Full -length colonoscopy. And did his liver function test improve uh, on the um, um, ERSO? Initially, yes. But after the second presentation, where I think the ARP was 800, um, from then on, um, what was also interesting with him is that he was taking alcohol in the beginning and he committed to stopping. And I must say, it's after he stopped, it's another confounding thing. Now, he, he really is adamant that he's not taking alcohol, no drugs, no paracetamol. We've excluded all other possible contributors. Um, I think it's just a marker of the disease and, and, and the severe progression, unrelenting progression of, of PSC that we are probably seeing here rather than, um, you know, contribution from other things. He, he really is adamant that he stopped alcohol, which was quite significant in the beginning. But yeah, that's his story. Great. Thank you so much uh, to you, Ram, and uh, to you, Wayne, for the comments. And now um, we're going to go on to your talk, and I'm sure you'll bring out all other aspects of PSC in the context of IBD, and I suppose maybe even cover some of the new aspects of the newer guidelines. But over to you, and we can have a discussion after, afterwards. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so uh, thank you, Dr. Makan, Ram, for, for that initial introduction or lead into this topic. Uh, it's definitely been a challenging patient. So the intention of this is not to, to reinvent you know, any wheels, but just to, to go through the process that we went through in, 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 in revising this condition and a condition definitely that, that showed us its sinister progression in this case. Um, so what we will do is we'll look at the extra intestinal manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, I'll discuss pathogenesis and evaluation of PSCUC specifically. Uh, a little about the dreaded complications, um, colorectal cancer and cholangiocarcinoma. I'll touch on the management of, of PSC in this setting. Uh, as Mashiko has, has, has alluded to, the uh, co coincidentally and conveniently, the ECHO uh, Society has updated their guideline in June 2023. So I'll just touch on the PSC points from that guideline, and then we'll, we'll conclude. And hopefully we can, um, I'm not sure if we'll be any clearer, but at least we'll be enlightened as to uh, you know, PSC with regards to this case. So extraintestinal manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease are a well-known entity. Um, when I talk to the students about them, I, I talk about the six big groups, the eyes, the skin, the joints, articular, uh, appendicular and axial disease, metabolic bone disease, uh, osteopenia and osteoporosis, and then not forgetting the hematological system with, with you know, myriad of ways in which a patient can become anemic uh, with inflammatory bowel disease. And then, of course, the dysfibrinogenemia, which predispose patient to thrombosis. Um, but for this uh, discussion, then the liver-related uh, uh, extra-intestinal manifestations, which we know a patient can have autoimmune you know, hepatitis, uh, primary biliary cholangitis, PSC, sclerosing cholangitis, and this can be in the setting of UC or Crohn's disease. And then importantly, these patients are not uh, immune to having other reasons for sclerosing cholangitis, as we've alluded to now in the preceding discussion. Um, this this, this uh, article in the Nature Review um, uh, really looked at this topic in detail, and they, they, they coined this term of systemic overlap syndrome, which encompasses this immune um, dysregulation of inflammatory bowel disease, and that how that coincides with um, th these autoimmune or immune-mediated phenomena in the liver, um, and that was termed PSC-IBD. Uh, the focus of this lecture then will, will, will slant towards PSC-UC because this was our, our patient presentation. Um, okay, 
If we look at PSC, um, this is an immune-mediated chronic liver disease with progressive inflammation and fibrosis of the biliary tree, uh, resulting in multifocal intra- and extrahepatic bile duct strictures, uh, like our patient, chronic cholestasis with its ensuing um, hepatocyte injury, fibrosis, cirrhosis as uh, fibrosis as as dictated as displayed by our patient's histology and then ultimately end-stage liver disease. Sorry for the spelling error there. Um, most importantly, the, 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 it is the most important hepatobiliary complication amongst UC patients, and it's a risk factor, scarily, for both cholangiocarcinoma and, and colorectal cancer. If we look at the pathogenesis, it's very interesting. Um, you, you have this interplay between your, your, you know, your, your epigenome, microbiome, your metabolic milieu, um, the bile acids um, and the immune system in the gut. And as we know, we have this highway from the gut to the liver called the portal system. So the idea is that you have recruitment of, of your alpha-4 integrin, uh, beta-7 integrin and CCR receptor um, uh, recruitment or receptor recruitment in the bile or in the liver itself. And the recruitment of these uh, activated T cells and B cell milieu uh, then via the portal system and the liver hepatic or the liver vessels results in this uh, activation of the, the inflammatory cascade within the liver and the bile ducts. Macrophage activation uh, ups the levels of transforming growth factor beta, um, unrelenting stellate cell or hepatic uh, stellate cell activation with laying down of collagen and fibroblasts and a vicious cycle then. So this cross-communication between what the inflammatory cascade in the gut and the liver, um, um, you know, obviously other secondary causes would, would contribute and speed up the process, result in this fibrosis um, of the biliary tree, the bile ducts, and this can be the intrahepatic biliary tree, as well as the extrahepatic biliary tree, as we've seen in our patient's case. Immune-mediated disease, we, we talk about autoantibodies, and uh, if you look, there are many antibodies that are studied. The most uh, sort of most studied one is the P-anchor, uh, with most, a lot of literature on that, and, and highest prevalence, um, you know, with regards to PSC of this antibody uh, being present. So that's an important one to consider uh, in seeing these patients. I look at the epidemiology of PSC in IBD. It's the most common, it's, it's the most important, but also the most common extraintestinal hepatobiliary complication of IBD. We know that 70 to 80% of PSC patients have concomitant IBDs. So if you diagnose a patient with PSC, it is then crucial to, to do the endoscopy and, um, and, and make sure that you don't miss um, IBD with the high prevalence uh, in this group of PSC patients. The opposite is important also, that if you have a patient with IBD, you have to screen them for PSC uh, with every visit and, and at least ask them to do a symptom uh, check with regards to the symptoms of cholestasis, uh, as 2 to 8% of, of IBD patients will develop in their lifetimes PSC. 60% of patients are male, and then the median age of diagnosis in the literature that I've looked at is 40, 40 years. Cardinal symptoms are fatigue, pruritus, and right upper quadrant pain, which our patient had all of them. Uh, this image is from a PSC support group in the UK, and they emphasize a lot about how if you don't ask a patient for these symptoms, you, you actually, they won't admit to them because, you know, many of them will be seeing you for their inflammatory bowel disease, and they'll be concerned about stool frequency and blood in the stool and so forth, and, and many of them are viewed as in remission. Um, and then later to find that actually they they actually did have these complaints, which they might, may have viewed as nonspecific. So always ask about these three symptoms in your IBD patients. Um, we'd look for jaundice, hepatomegaly, and cirrhosis, but I think the, the, the idea is that these are late signs in a patient with chronic cholestasis. And I think if we wait for them to occur before we pick them up, we, we would have missed the boat. Uh, so to emphasize pain, Fatigue and pruritus are the cardinal things to check for in a patient that you want to start screening for PSC uh, in this IBD group. Particular patterns in the setting of, of PSC UC. So the IBD seems to also be in, in reverse modulated in some or other way. 
with this crosstalk that you get between these two entities. We see that there's a higher prevalence of rectal sparing UC um, in this group, um, this, the entity of periappendiceal patchy inflammation. They're more likely to have pancolitis, more likely to have backwash ileitis because of that, a higher incidence of colorectal cancer, and then a poorer survival. Um, we know that UC itself, you know, in many patients, especially if in remission, does less, uh, you know, to influence your mortality. That tied with PSC, you know, uh, portends a very grave, you know, much grave uh, prognosis. Smoking again, um, we often try to, to sort of dispel this idea that smoking is protective in any way, but uh, it's said to protect against PSC or parchitis, but the data is inconsistent here. And then the protective effect of appendectomy uh, is also conflicting if you look at the literature. So the evaluation of these patients is again the early uh, clinical picture pain, uh, pruritus, um, and, 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 and uh, you know patient just not feeling well, fatigue. Um, one can do the autoantibodies, and as we've touched on already in patients with with, with PSC, then to do other uh, antibody markers and and tumor markers in their follow up. We'll, we'll touch on that later. The ARP is the most important um, cholestatic enzyme to, to use on, on follow-up that in conjunction with the gamma GT. Um, your aminotransferases are, are often raised and it should alight the one, especially if there's a massive hypergammaglobulinemia to the existence of a, a overlap or concomitant autoimmune hepatitis in the patient. Another reason why a biopsy would be considered. Uh, we start with an ultrasound. Um, if that doesn't yield an answer and the suspicion is high, we then, if um, something pointed towards um, an intervention that's required, like dilatation of the CBD and ERCP would be done. But in most cases, the MRCP is the recommended diagnostic test, we've, which we've done in this case. The liver biopsy came much later, um, you know, or in patients with a normal MRCP where one still suspects small duct disease, which could have been missed on MRCP. Well, as I've alluded to, then if there's overlap or this consideration for overlap with autoimmune hepatitis. The diagnostic criteria is an in increase in serum ALP level for more than six months. Cholangiographic findings of bile duct strictures, this beaded appearance or, or string of bead appearance, a very thready bilary tree through the liver, um, and an exclusion, importantly, of secondary causes for sclerosing cholangitis. I've listed the causes there. I'm not going to read through the whole list, but the ones highlighted are cases that we've seen at our center uh, over the last few years. Um, the, the, the one that, that, that comes to mind all the time is the AIDS-related cholangiopathy. We have a number of patients in our clinic you know, with HIV, and we've had a patient with, with ulcerative colitis um, as well as HIV that, that we really look at the ARP closely. Um, she you know, doesn't have symptoms, but we know that AIDS angiopathy can, can really be very uh, deleterious in the setting as well. So the literature on the MRCP, uh, this was an interesting study uh, looking at uh, a long-term follow-up, uh, a prospective follow-up of patients from Norway. Um, they looked at doing 300, they did 322 patients. They did MRCPs from them at the end of this, towards the end of this 20-year follow-up. And they found in summary that they were 24 patients that they could diagnose with PSC. 15 of those patients had just mild symptomatology actually with normal liver biochemistry. Um, and then seven patients were known in that time. Um, that was a percentage of 2.2%. One patient had a biopsy and they, they made the diagnosis of small duct PSC. And then this, this uh, gave them the overall prevalence of 8.1%, which ties in nicely with the figures that we know. The important thing is that uh, what they alluded to was that PSC could progress with subclinical disease. And this is just emphasize that if you, you, know, you have to have a high index of suspicion for it. And then MRCP uh, screening is something that they were advocating for. Uh, they were reserved with regards to the longer term outcome of these patients. I'm going to talk about colorectal cancer now, and um, I think if you look at the risk factors in UC for colorectal cancer, PSC stands out in most literature as, as a major risk factor, third only to extent of disease and, and duration of disease. And there's many pathogenic factors and theories for this, amongst them altered microbiota, 
the chronic inflammation that I've alluded to already, and then the carcinogenic factors that we're aware of. So the AGA and ECHO uh, guide us with regards to your initial surveillance, and they talk about eight years after colitis, but the, these two societies definitely list diagnosis of PSC as a point where you start with your colonic surveillance, irrespective of the years of colitis. And they advise uh, random biopsies or, or targeted biopsies where you have colonoscopy. The BSG talks about surveillance colonoscopy after 10 years, but in their um, sort of guide, they don't make this diagnosis of PSC statement. And then in both, they say you stratify your further surveillance based on your histological findings uh, during that initial surveillance. Cholangiocarcinoma gives you, a, you have a two to four times increased risk with ulcerative colitis alone. But with PSC, the, the risk increases versus the normal population quite dramatically, 160 in some literature to up to 400. Uh, in others, uh, the increased risk uh, with this combination of PSC and UC. And this demands that we, we survey these patients. And the guide there is that we do an annual non-invasive imaging of the bilary tract, either MRCP or, or ultrasound, and then an annual serum CA-199. Again, our patient CA-199 was not raised. And on, I think we've done two or three values uh, in the time that we, we've seen him uh, with this suspicion. Uh, your diagnostic confirmation then further is based on the clinical judgment. And I think if you see a patient that's known with the condition and they, they have worsening in terms of their jaundice, fever, or weight loss, uh, if they have any new elevation, like in our patient of the ARP, or bilirubin, or both, and this uh, is whether or not the CA99 is raised, um, one should, should definitely you know, escalate your, 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 your investigative investigation of these patients. Despite what you do, though, you know, if this is the entity, the prognosis of this um, condition uh, remains very poor um, in the best hands, it seems. So how would we manage patients with PSC and IBD, and in this case, PSC-UC? I think um, the, early, the, 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 late, the, the earliest sort of uh, article that I've read now um, from the NEJM, which looked at PSC, um, or the latest one that looked at PSC uh, declared that there was no effective medical therapy. I think this is still the case if you look at literature uh, since then. Uh, what we can do is achieve and maintain remission in the IBD based on the best relevant guidelines that we have. And I think, you know, in our patient's case, we, we endeavored to do so and fortunately responded to, to uh, care. We, we didn't have to escalate to to, to biologic therapy in his case, and that, that may be a question. Uh, it's important to screen for and manage, stop, or avoid contributors to liver injury. Uh, there's a paucity of uh, alluding to this in the literature, but you have to then make sure, like in our patient, that if he is taking any, any alcohol that has to stop patients on analgesics chronically, patients on other medication, but that might be liver injurious, whether prescribed or not, uh, should be addressed in these patients with PSCUC. And then most literature in terms of treatment of PSC would go around ursodeoxycholic acid, which is an interesting uh, agent. Um, it is a secondary bile acid, which means that it is not um, created or produced in the liver. Uh, in most animals, or in most vertebrates, it's produced from bile acid uh, conversion of uh, 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 keno deoxycholic acid uh, in the gut and then reabsorption or, or recirculation uh, or enteropathic recirculation. Um, the, the only animal or vertebrate that's said to produce it in the liver is the, the brown bear or this um, uh, genus of ursus uh, bears. So, so that's where the ursodeoxycholic acid gets its name from, from this ursus. ursus uh, bear or the brown bear, which we see in the US mainly. And um, it is produced now synthetically and uh, is available in the form of, uh, in South Africa at the moment, in the form of Urso Falk. We used to have Urso 10, but that seems not to be available anymore. It improves liver enzymes, uh, reduces the risk of colorectal cancer in PSC. Um, how is this happening? We, we, we know that it upregulates the transporters, the, the the BSEP, the MRP2, and the MRP3, 
uh, to to transfer or to assist with with its choleretic function to to help with with the transmission of of bile through the the, the bile tree or into the bile tree towards the canalicular membrane. Uh, there are many ideas about anti-inflammatory properties, anti-apoptotic properties, immune modulation, uh, bile acid pool modification, cell signaling, and mitochondrial integrity. Uh, but nothing has been shown to, to, to reduce time and need for liver transplantation, reduce the risk for cholangiocarcinoma, and definitely it's not shown to reduce mortality figures in the setting of patients with established PSC. The idea is that you start at a dose of 10 to 15 milligrams per kilogram a day, divide into three doses. Uh, if you see an improvement, you can increase the dose to 20 milligrams per kilogram per day. Uh, higher doses can be used, but a lot of literature talks about poorer outcome in these patients um, and, and side effect. The side effect profile then becomes significant, like diarrhea and so forth, gastrointestinal upset at the higher doses. What is also said is that if you watch your patient and, and you, you don't have a response, especially in the ALP, if that's you know, remaining elevated or increasing, um, there's not much benefit to persist, especially at the higher doses of acid. acid. Number of cl clinical trials are on the go. So the, the one that we've uh, read about recently is the uh, obeticolic acid, which is also an epimer of the kinodeoxycholic acid which is said to be an antifibrotic, which helps you know, to prevent the fibrosis in, in the bile of the tree. A number of monoclonal antibodies in various um, sort of modulations or targets, particularly with regards to this white cell chemotaxis, uh, integrin inhibition, for example, formulations of acid-deoxycholic acid. And then interestingly, oral antibiotics and FMT, uh, fecal microbiota transplantation, also in study. Um, yeah, so I think uh, the, the, the article I alluded to or I referred to earlier on suggests that if you don't have a response in six months, also the oxycholic acid uh, should be stopped and you should enroll, enroll your patient in a clinical trial. Uh, I'm not aware of a current South African clinical trial. Um, yeah, I think we'd be glad to hear if anyone has any ideas uh, for us there. Cholestyramine can be used to assist with pruritus. It has no effect in, in assisting of any of the other uh, benefits or outcomes with regards to PSC. So you can attempt it. Remember to give it uh, uh, dosing is important with cholestyramine, not to include it with the dose of, of your acidioxycholic acid and other treatments. So you now we use 10 o'clock and 3 o'clock as the points where we administer the cholestyramine, and that helps with the patient's. Uh, um, symptom of pruritus. Um, other agents, the, the five ASAs, we know in ulcerative colitis that's protective uh, in those with, with Crohn's colitis and with ulcerative colitis, so that should continue uh, in this setting. Um, folic acid, calcium, vitamin D, and there's a host of other agents which are postulated to be of benefit in this setting, but, but not proven. Obviously, in a patient with, with chronic cholestasis, you have the complications of chronic cholestasis, um, and one should then uh, replace, uh, as you see, put, you know, with regards to the deficiencies that we see, like the fat-soluble vitamins, um, calcium, vitamin D, malabsorption, and so forth. Surveillance endoscopy, as suggested by the guidelines, one to two yearly. Um, in the patient that's worsening, ERCP with stenting for dominant strictures, and in this meticulous assessment for, for suspicious areas on ERCP uh, for, for malignancy. Ultimately, these patients will require liver transplantation. We think this is where our patient is at the moment. He's uh, undergoing uh, psychosocial social worker consultation to see you know, the feasibility with regards to this. And um, we hope to, to, to make him a booking at the transplant center uh, to assist him. Um, and then importantly in the literature, you know, after the patient has the liver transplantation, it doesn't l lower the risk of the colorectal carcinoma uh, in these patients who have had established PSC. You see in that abnormal uh, metabolic or inflammatory milieu uh, crosstalk. So your colorectal cancer surveillance should persist following the liver transplantation as well. 
So just to emphasize, uh, the, the the ECHO guidelines were updated, and, and there were three statements that they or they revised and looked at, and uh, they've reached consensus on all of these three statements. And and the statements mirror the literature to date. And and uh, what's important for me is that, you know, we they give this appreciation that patients with UC are at increased risk of PSC. The prevalence figures seems not to have changed, and we, we agree on that. Uh, the second or the third point there is that in IBD patients with persistent elevation of cholestatic enzymes, symptoms of cholestasis such as pruritus and prominent hyla lymphadenopathy, PSC should be investigated with high quality MRCP. So I think they also make this point that MRCP should be used and that um, it's all. So you, you, you need not have elevated uh, um, cholestatic enzymes, you don't need to have the cholestatic enzymes, but in a patient with an index of suspicion with symptoms, you, you, you can, um, you know, go down the route of evaluating them with MRCP as well, uh, the UC patient. Um, I've touched on the acidioxycholic acid, and they also agree that you, you, you may improve liver biochemistry, but there's no demonstrated impact on disease progression, so that I've, we've touched on. And then uh, this emphasis that patients with PSC IBD like in our patient PSCUC, uh, we should refer these patients on to centers where there's expertise um, and thereafter, you know, close uh, correlation and close follow up of these patients uh, is paramount. So, to conclude, I think, you know, consideration of PSC in all patients with IBD is important. And I think we've emphasized the low threshold that one. Uh, have to have in patients with symptoms for the MRCP to exclude uh, PSC. Uh, endoscopic screening for IBD in all patients who then you diagnose with PSC first, that's, that's, that's imperative. Uh, you have to achieve and maintain remission. It almost sounds like it's the, 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 you know, the, the important thing or commitment that we have to make in these patients, uh, that we have to control their IBD at all costs. It's where we can invest uh, our time in them with all the non-availability of, of curative um, management for, for the PSC. Um, we have to appreciate the morbidity and significant mortality associated with PSC UC despite the therapies, uh, the cancer surveillance we've emphasized, and then the time is rever uh, referral of these patients and not to, to delay the evaluation if you see them being persistent with their symptoms and, 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 and ALP and, and transaminases or your, your ductal enzymes, which are not, not improving, you've got to expedite your medical and surgical evaluation and therapy, and then ultimately uh, this consideration for liver transplantation. Thank you very much. Um, not, not a rosy story for our patient, but, but hopefully, you know, with uh, acceptance on the liver transplant program, you know, we can offer him a better road than he's on at the moment. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Wayne, for, for a comprehensive uh, coverage of what, a, it's a very difficult topic, both from the IBD perspective and also from the uh, PSC perspective. So uh, thank you so much for, for, for summarizing it for us and also just updating us on the newer guidelines uh, about the management of this uh, really difficult condition, I think for patients uh, as well as for us. So there is a question from Akwi. Akwi, welcome. Um, she asks, what is your recommendation for diagnosis of extrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinoma, particularly in settings where ERCP is not available? Yeah, so, so I mean, the, the tumor markers are, are what we have, and then um, MRCP uh, would give a good view of your, your bilary tree there, and that, that, that could help. Um, but ultimately, to get a patient to a center where this can be done, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Um, yeah. What about um, PTC or something like that? So some yeah. other way to access? Certainly. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'm, I, I mean, our patient had to, we, we struggled. I think the image that Dr. McCann showed, uh, we really struggled with ERCP on him. And the radiologist did oblige in his case. And, you know, he spent a time with the PTC with a drain in. I think he's got a drain inside too, as we speak. Sorry, uh, yeah, so PTC definitely for access there and rendezvous. Um, but yeah, so that, that was in our, 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 our management of this patient, but despite that and brushings and, and, and histology there, uh, 
uh, we couldn't uh, you know, yield cholangiocarcinoma in his yeah. case. Yeah. May I ask if you've got um, fish, so in situ hybridization uh, at your center? Um, not that I'm aware of, no. No. So that's something. We actually do that. No, I'm, I'm not do, aware. They, they, use, they use it in the hematology department. Yeah. Oh, okay. So they actually do have the, the tools, uh, but uh, you the, guys. The, the tools. Got the yeah, machine. We, yeah. we haven't approached them for, for this purpose yet. Oh, sure. Uh, Bilal, thank you for joining. I was going to come to you because uh, I have a lot of questions for you, and no doubt you've got a lot of comments. So. Um, Please feel free to ask any questions and also comment about the case and, and just more generally as well. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Prof. Uh, thanks, Wayne and Ram for uh, for for drawing attention to um, to this problem, which uh, yeah, is 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 as as you pointed out, a lot of hard work uh, for all involved. Um, how, or just what was the time interval between him presenting? I saw his albumin was as low as sixteen um on 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 initial presentation and i'm just wondering how far back was that his initial one as dr mccann alluded to was march 2022 uh, he was very ill then he was on alcohol then as well so i think that sort of played a role with regards to his initial presentation his inr was 1.7 and there was an initial improvement in terms of his synthetic functions and hence the idea to try and shepherd him on um, yeah, that was the story yeah. with him, March 2022. I think I think just the the, the you know the uh, possibility of uh, uh, still a calangio, um is very high. Uh, you know, uh, with the with these sort of patients, the diagnosis of a calangio carcinoma um, with the dominant strictures that that uh, you're you're speaking about, the fact that it does look like both left and right sided ducts are involved and they you know just just on the images presented there is that definite fuzziness around that perihilar region um which which is which is of concern um an mri primavist was that uh considered no we did just not an, do that just okay. an mrtp okay um yeah, and then um, Urso, um, I see the easel has come out with new recommendations. Uh, you know, uh, Urso has been so controversial with uh, with PSC. It's been on, it's been off, um, and and uh, it's nice to see that easel has come out with a decent recommendation. Yes, it doesn't affect the tra your trajectory, but what I have seen is that it can offer patients significant relief even from the pruritus. Cholestyramine is no longer recommended in PSC-related uh, pruritus. Um, uh, it is, it, it's, it's, you know, one of those drugs that lands up with possibly more complications than not, uh, and absorbing other, um, other, other fat-soluble vitamins and so, and and other nutrients. Um, so, what is interesting is that the recommendation from from Easel is that uh, it's actually a, a fibrate, then going on to rifampicin, and uh, then something like um, uh, an SSRI such as um, Zoloft, what is uh, a Um So, so uh, yeah, um, it's nice to see that uh, that has that has kind of kind of made its made its way back in um but thanks thanks for the excellent presentation thank you thanks for the contribution thanks we, we Bilal. Look, i'll come to you um Jill, we look I'm forward to to having him at their center uh, yeah. uh, i think that's the idea to refer him up yeah i think we've we've reached our, our, our the end of our tether here yeah uh jill yeah, thanks, Mash. Sorry for joining so late, and I hope the questions that I'm going to ask have not already been answered. But Wayne um, or, or Bilal, your thoughts on vedolizumab and PSC? Yeah, so in the setting of, of um, the Integrin, um, if I'm going to go first, I'll, I'll, I'll continue. Go ahead. So, so, so the alpha-4, beta-7, um, as I've alluded to then in the talk, this crosstalk, the main mediator there, or the main idea, is that you have this chemotaxis, uh, T cell chemotaxis, and this recruitment uh, in the, the canaliculum membrane, in the bile 
um, uh, the, the biology tree. So the very same uh, CCR alpha-4, beta-7 uh, recruitment theoretically can be inhibited by the vedolizumab as well. So that recruitment would also be inhibited by the vedolizumab. And hence, uh, it, I, I mentioned it that we hadn't got to biologic therapies in any case. I mean, when we saw him, vedolizumab you know, was not really a, a thing in initially, it was not a thought. Uh, but certainly, you know, in a patient early on, uh, potentially if we, we see this happening, you could inhibit that crosstalk uh, and, and chemotaxis at the bio, uh, biology tree level. Um, and that's a very interesting, you know, with the MADCAM and the CCL25 uh, uh, chemotaxis. Uh, so that's what uh, I can think about with regards to vedolizumab. So certainly. Thanks, Wayne. And then just my second question to, to both of you. Um, in a patient who's going to have a liver transplant, what's your feeling about having a colectomy prior to the liver transplant, even if there's no dysplasia? Because obviously the risk doesn't go away after the transplant, and that's going to be a lot more complicated once they've been transplanted. Wayne, can I jump in? Please. Please. Um, so, Jill, just on the just on the vedolizumab, um, additionally, it it doesn't really seem to have all that much effect on uh, the course of the PSC. Um, so, you know, where where I think vedo uh, would be beneficial is where uh, uh, you have patients where you know you, you're worried about other uh, immune suppressive effects. Um, it does certainly seem to be the uh, go-to post-liver transplant where, where you have the IBD that, uh, that flares and, you know, uh, potentially the step before you're talking about uh, a, a, a potential colectomy. In terms of liver transplantation, um, the advice is still not to remove the colon prior to uh, any, any, any potential transplant. You would like the IBD to be as quiescent as possible going into transplantation, um, and 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 therefore as controlled as 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 much as you can. And whether you're going to use something like Vito in that run up is 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 possible. Where there is a bit more evidence is coming up with uh, um, because PSC is one of those conditions that recurs, um, and it can recur quite dramatically post-liver transplantation. Patients who are coming up for uh, redo transplants with active UC, um, those are the patients that uh, I think the recommendation is becoming somewhat, the, well, the evidence is building up in terms of a colectomy prior to offering transplant or, or if too unwell, shortly thereafter. Um, uh, but you know, essentially, essentially within the first six or so months um, after, um, yeah, you may you may be seeing an application from me for Vito uh, um, for the biologic. So we've just had a patient actually with an autoimmune hepatitis, um, and interestingly, no PSC on explant um, that had noted quiescent IBD on her pre-transplant uh, uh, screening scope, she has really flared up. So I've actually put in an application this week. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Vila. Um, I'll come back to you. I see Badreddin has asked, why is UC more prevalent than Crohn's disease in patients with PSC? I'm not sure there's an answer. Uh, anyone on the panel? Not sure. I, I tried to look at this uh, in the preparation of this talk, and I, I don't know if there's an easy answer, or there is an answer. Uh, mm. It's definitely, uh, you know, PSC more spoken about with regards to UC, but mm. uh, PSC CD does exist, but it's definitely not as deleterious a condition as PSC UC. It seems it's more um, mm. the hazardous one to have is PSC UC, but why more prevalent? I, I can't say. Jill, Bilal, any thoughts? Or yeah, any I, I think it's related to the colon. My understanding was that PSC and Crohn's disease is almost exclusively in colitis and that there's probably some sort of a crosstalk between colonic epithelium and, and uh, the bile ducts. And obviously in Crohn's to get sort of an extensive colitis is, is well, it's obviously at, at the moment of UC, but not necessarily of Crohn's. 
Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I hope I got that right. Yeah, I, I think that's it. And, and just remember that we still haven't really figured out the full pathogenesis around PSC. We know that there is an autoimmune component and there being autoimmune features, um, but the exact nature of, of, of um, uh, its pathogenesis is still poorly understood. And as Wayne correctly pointed out, there are even trials looking at vancomycin and uh, as, as a therapeutic agent. The fact that immune suppression and steroids do not work for PSC, um, uh, you know, uh, further pushes it somewhat back from that pure autoimmune uh, type type disease. But certainly the colonic inflammation, the translocation of, of, of various bacteria and other gut-derived products from the colon um, is, is considered to be where the process kicks off. And why there is this talk about, uh, you know, with uh, redo liver transplants of uh, colectomies. Mm. I think it's also important to note that PSC and the course of PSC and ulcerative colitis can run very independently of each other. Um, and, and, and it's not to say that patients with, with colectomies um, are fully protected from developing PSC at a later stage. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have two more questions, but I don't want to hog the space. Um, are there any other questions? Um, Chris, um, are you on? Is there anything you'd like to say? Or anyone else for that matter? Ex no, excellent presentation. Thanks very much, Mash and the team. I see we've got a record. We had a record 54 people on today. Well done. Thanks, Chris. It is a, such an important topic. Doctor, I put I'm my head up there. Eh? Okay. Dr. Ramanati from the Free State, I have noted. Yes, good evening, and I wish to commend Ram and, uh, and Wayne for putting up this presentation. It's quite a big subject, so that's why it's got uh, many questions. I wish to, to agree quickly with uh, Bilal that uh, the, the, the pathogenesis and together the etiology for this condition is rather multi, very multifactorial from what I've, from what I've studied as well. And also, there's a also some genetic comp genetic component to this condition, and there's certain haplotypes like the DR DR3, but uh, that's quite deep. Yeah, because the other thing is that one would think there could be maybe there's some sepsis going through the portal system going up there, but it's been proven that it's, it's there's no infection in those in the blood of patients who have UC if you want to say you want to claim for infection. So really, it's, it's quite. Yeah, it's difficult. That's what I'm saying. I'm agreeing. It's quite, it's quite difficult, multifactorial. And before I, okay, I then I just want to find out from Bilal his opinion for the pruritus in terms of using the opiate agonist like naltrexone. Yeah, good question. Because I know, I do know that patients said, I mean, they, it puts them to sleep, but I wasn't sure whether it's the sleep because they can sleep or it's because now it's working. I'm not sure what his opinion on that. So naltrexone certainly is in that in that algorithm, um, but I think just just not necessarily going to be first first or second line. Um, I think definitely optimize your your acidioxycholic acid. Um, uh, look at uh, um, uh, things such as uh, you know if 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 the itch is mild, I'd even I'd even give them something like. Um, uh, a short act or um, a, a sedating antihistamine such as Phenagan at night if mm -hmm. sleep is 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 being interfered. Remember, there's all the lifestyle modifications that these patients can can consider as well. Um, oatmeal extract, body lotions, um, something in the oatmeal extract has been shown to to improve the pruritus, but just the well moisturized mm -hmm. skin, avoiding very hot showers. Um, avoiding rough clothing um, and, and, and fabrics. Those, those are the basic lifestyle measures to, to, to institute uh, initially. If mild, I, I generally use something like a sedating antihistamine at night, but remember there's tachyphylaxis and therefore it's for rescue therapy. If it's persistent, I think there's good evidence from the Fitch trial and the bez Erso trial looking at uh, the fibrates um for for that for that indication um a dose of 400 milligrams of bears vibrators is 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 what i'd give 
rifampicin, and you don't need to give much, um, 150 milligrams, of course, watch your enzymes um, carefully just to make sure that there isn't a, a, uh, any, any further drug toxicities. And then I think these other, a, and, you know, I mean, honestly, when you're dealing with a chronic disease, such as PSC, where you're sitting in front at your doctor's office and you're being told, listen, I haven't actually got anything to cure you. Patients get down, give them the sertraline, right? It, 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 may, it may very well help, uh, um, help them in other ways as well. Um, and then I'd look at things such as, you know, your naltrexone, the um, uh, cholestyramine and uh, your, and, and, and then, you know, interestingly, there are newer agents, um, your ileal bile acid transport uh, inhibitors or the IBATs, they're, they're coming out um, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, the, I mean, the main issue there is that it's going to worsen diarrhea, which in a colitis patient is maybe not really what you're looking at uh, as, as, as a big side effect. Um, but um, yeah, Marilixabat is available. You can get it on section 21 if you've got 930,000 rand a month. That's mm -hmm. that's the price. Uh, thank you. I appreciate. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, uh, I think that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. But thank you, my team. Thank you very much. Going. If if I can just uh, you know add on that massive figure, one thing I always do for all these patients with cholestasis, uh, and tying in with the oatmeal extract, uh, in our uh, pharmacy in the state, we we have aqueous cream, and we have emulsifying ointment. I think these two is the formula for me. Uh, lukewarm baths, uh, change your soap, whatever it is, whether it was Dove or Protex or whatever the case, change it to emulsifying ointment plainly as a soap and aqueous cream uh, to apply as an emollient afterwards many times a day. And, and, and I've gotten success with that uh, on its own before trying anything else many a time. Much cheaper. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I Good. see this. There's one more question, but um, I am mindful of time and, and we could go on uh, forever. Uh, this topic is really fascinating. Um, so um, Ahmed, I'm not going to take your question uh, because we need to close. And I'd also just like to just ask people to have a look at the ASLD guidelines as well. They've made some statements which uh, are interesting. So please uh, have, a, have a look at that. Um, Jill, do you want to close or must I just go ahead? I'll close, Mesh, thanks. Okay, so firstly, thanks to the speakers for great presentations, um, and also thanks to Bilal for joining us and giving his expertise. Our thanks to ECHO University of New Mexico and the ECHO India team, just to remind you that the recordings are available on the Gastro Foundation website. Of course, as always, thanks to Chris and the Gastro Foundation, and um, thanks to the sponsors, and uh, next week it, it, it will be um, upper endoscopy. So thanks, everybody. Have a good evening, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.